Last week we sculpted this rabbit. In this video we're going to mold him in silicone rubber, cast him in urethane, and paint him. Stick around, I think it should be fun. In a urethane casting, that wire neck is going to be too weak, so I'm going to beef it up using this thin plastic straw. Let's see if we can do this without melting that plastic straw. Yeah, that straw is pretty impermeable to heat, I gotta say it. I was thinking that that straw might want to melt. When I cut this mold open, I'm gonna cut it along this leg, around the shoulder, and up this flume of the neck. And I'm gonna cut it across in between the legs. So the parting line is gonna be this kind of complex thing. So because I'm concerned I'm gonna catch air in here, I wanna put one more vent in this model than it would otherwise have. And by attaching it to the end of the neck, it will allow the resin to flow all the way to the bottom when I pour the casting. We're also going to make the head of the rabbit in this same mold. Now, the whole point, obviously, is because uh, we want to save as much as possible on rubber. The more parts you can gang into a mold, the less rubber you use and the more economical it becomes. So rubber is expensive and you don't want to waste it. So making gang molds is a great way to cut down your costs. Okay went in pretty thick. That's all fit nice and tight all in the same mold. Incredibly, that works. Now, one last job is to put in a vent that will let the air out of the head. That's basically the most, probably the most important principle in casting is the resin has to flow in and in order for the resin to flow in, the air that's down in the mold has to flow out. The resin will not push the air out of the way. Air is amazing stuff, let me tell you. All right, so this is where we're at. We have two parts, the body and the head, crammed into the same small cavity. And uh, now we're gonna put a cup around it and pour some rubber around it. And then we'll have a pretty complex little cut job in front of us to liberate the parts from the mold. But you will see, liberate them, we shall. No worries. We will liberate these pieces out of there, and life will be magnificent. Okay, I took my time, and I sealed that all the way around with a pretty hefty bead of wax. My insurance policy is going to be a nice, soft, small bead of oil clay around the base, just in case there's any, like... Now, I'm not putting any pressure on that cup at all. This is just to seal around the wood and also to just form a little bit more of a physical barrier to cup movement. But I'm really putting the pressure down into the wood. So in case there's any little chance that rubber could seep out because of the grain of the wood or something. I'm pouring two molds today. The smaller one is our jackrabbit and the other one is a commercial job I'm gonna pour at the same time. I keep a lot of old molds around and they come in handy because now all I got to do is find a couple of old molds that are the exact same size as the cups I'm going to pour today, weigh them out, and I know exactly how much rubber to dispense for today's molds. So I changed the ratio a little bit. There's a little bit more hardener than you technically need. You really need 10%, so 300 grams of, of rubber and 30 grams of hardener but I put in a little more and that's because it's chilly and I need this stuff to cure. Okay, we're at the vacuum pump. Let's fire it up. You can see the valve. Pulling the vat going up slowly. Slow but sure, it's going up and you can start to see material rising. Now, if I did this right, <laughs> It will not overflow the cup. It'll come right up to the edge. Let's see how good I am. If, I'm, if it overflows the edge, I'm going to be really pissed. Oh, oh, I mean, look at that. Just stand back and admire the genius. <laughs> Actually, I've done this enough times that I know that you could put exactly 330 grams into one of that size, and it won't overflow the cup. But you do have to have a lot of space in your cup. Otherwise, the rubber will overflow and make a mess of your tank. All right, we're ready to start pouring here. Now I'm going to pour from the bottom up. And if you've watched my channel, you're sick of me saying pour from the bottom up. But 
that you always pour from the bottom up. And that's so that the rubber will push the air out and you won't trap bubbles. So as the rubber rises up in the mold, it pushes the air out in front of it. All right, it's the next day, it's 24 hours later, and it's time to peel the mold open. As it turned out, I glued the rabbit so strongly onto the base, <laughs> I, just, I couldn't get it apart. And uh, I wound up having to cut the base off the model. And I'm making very jagged cuts, as always, so that the parts lock together. Not making clean cuts. We just want to cut enough to free the part. You don't want to cut more than you have to cut. Let's see if we can't free that part now. I think we probably can. Yeah. <sighs> Head shape came out <clears throat> just fine and is actually in pretty good shape. No worries. And as you can see, that mold is going to close right up very, very nicely. The whole trick to doing complex molds is to have a very clear idea and a clear plan as to where you're going to cut and why. If you don't know where you're going, I have a very clear vision of where I'm going as I cut this mold open and what, and what I need to cut to release the piece. I have completely, as you can see, just absolutely destroyed the clay master. Now, <laughs> you better be good at mold making because uh, if you have, if this mold gets damaged or ruined in some way, well, you start all over, then you've lost the project. Uh, there's no getting around that. But we have got a perfectly serviceable mold. One that will close back up nicely because of the interlocking. We're gonna get it to close up perfectly, do its thing. Look at that, nice. We're gonna make a casting. I think we have a good mold, a usable mold and we should get some good parts out of it. This is a small mold. It's not gonna to require too much in the way of rubber bandage. So let's tie a rubber band. The reason I tie the rubber band is to customize the band to the size of the mold. It's not gonna require a lot of bands to keep it closed. All right, I think we're ready to pour. We have two to pour, the rabbit, and this is the funnel right here for the head of the rabbit. And that's the, the vent that lets the air out uh, of the head, and that's the vent, and the legs are serving as vents to let the air out of the bunny. All right, I've got the scale set up and balanced for that little cup. I'm gonna guess, because this is the first shot, and it is a guess, that we're gonna go with a 30 shot, 30 gram shot. So I'm gonna pour in the A side, and I'm gonna pour in 15 grams of A. It is a 50-50 blend. In other words, equal parts of A and B. Okay, that's about 15 grams of A. Now I'm gonna pour in the B side, 15 grams of the B side, except that it's got dye in it. Not very much. It's really a pretty tiny amount of dye that's required. But still, I'm inclined to overpour it just a little bit to compensate for the dye. So if it comes, it's getting there. That's about 30 grams, so a couple of drops more just to pretend for the dye. And I'd say, yeah, that's close enough. There just isn't that much dye in here. Okay, now we stir the resin and we go quick. It's pretty chilly in the studio today. And so I can take a little more time. If it was really hot in here, this stuff would kick fast. The temperature makes a huge difference when you're working with rubber and resins. The warmer the material temperature, the faster things cure and kick. And if it's really cold, it can take a long time to get it to kick. So let's pour this in. And you know they're full when you see the resin come rising up out of the, vent, out of the vents. It's going down the sprues. All right, so now it's already rising up out of those paws. And I'm gonna guess it's about to come rising up out of that vent. Yep, and there it is. So now the resin has risen up out of all of the vents. And we wanna make sure that it's full. 30 grams was very generous. I have a lot left over. If I'm gonna waste resin, it's gonna be on the first shot because I'm gonna overestimate how much I need. I really don't wanna run out. But the next shot, I will weigh the parts, obviously, and then I'll know exactly how much to mix. Into the tank, it goes. Okay, close the out outlet valve, pop in the door, and away we go. That's our witness cup. 
And uh, this is the leftover resin. This cup will tell us what's going on in the tank. You can actually see it starting to kick. See how it's going light? This uh, dark, it's pretty dark in the liquid, uh, in the pre-cured stage, but it's gonna uh, cure to a lighter gray, which it's already starting to do. It's already starting to turn colors. And you can also see it, see how it no longer, it hardly runs anymore? It's getting gel, it's at the gel stage. And you keep an eye on your witness cup and that tells you exactly what's going on inside your mold. Once this is 100% hard, you know you can extract the mold. All right, the witness cup tells us the story. It's ready to kick out of the mold. Open the release valve. And wait for all the pressure to come out of this tank. You're not gonna get this door open, hello? <laughs> This door is being held shut with 80 pounds of pressure pushing against it. You're not going to get open until the, uh, the air is all gone like it is now. Now we can go ahead and open it. And we can pull out our little guy. And there it is. Ta-da! Let's see if we can get these parts out nicely. See what we got. Oh yeah, coming out easy. Coming out clean. All right, that part cast all right. Not too bad. This is a trickier one to pull. Okay, we'll get them out like that. We'll get them out like that. And then we need to pull that web of rubber out from between his legs. See, ah, got it. And we need to pull the stem off. Oh yeah, got a little bent coming out of the mold. Just still a little tiny bit soft. I'm gonna put him on a flat surface and he is gonna cure up nice. Cool. Got a good casting, very pleased. And here's the finished casting. Now all we have to do is prime him, paint him, and put him back together. To figure out the colors, I made a drawing of him in Procreate. This will greatly speed the painting as I don't have to figure things out as I go along. For this project, I decided I'd switch to white primer, but the pieces were too light and the and the spray blew them all over the place. So I wound up sticking them to the paper with blue tack, and that worked out fine. We're ready to paint these pieces. And uh, this is a situation where my little oil clay blob and blue tack really comes into its own. Because well, all I've done here is taken a matchstick, uh, cut the heads off, cut the heads off the matches. You don't need the head, you just need the stick. And I put a little blob of blue tack or fun tack. Can you see that right there? Is it focusing? Okay. And um, you just stick your parts to them. And that means that you can paint these pieces very easily without handling them. Little tiny blob of blue tack. If a part, part has a hole in it, you don't need to uh, use blue tack. You can just jam the, jam the stick in there. So that's how I hold the parts, get them all set to go. And that is a quick and easy way to be able to paint them entirely instead of piecemeal and not have to touch them, not have to hold, and not worry about how to hold them. Got my wet palette system going. Put out a little bit of paint and we're ready to paint. Got a cup with water in it. One thing I do keep handy is paper towel because I don't like a lot of water in my brush. It waters down the paint too much. And let's get to painting. I'm going to hold on to the ear while I paint it. First coat. I want to make thin coats and, and more coats than one. I don't want to get it all coated or even try to get it all coated in one shot. I like multiple thin coats of paint so you get a better finish. And because of this method, you just can paint you know, the whole piece all at once. You don't have to wait for anything to dry. You just go on to the next part. Just keep painting. And because of my wet palette system, you're not gonna waste paint. Okay, let's paint, paint the chin part or the lower part of the head part or whatever the hell you wanna call this. Beautiful. And let's paint the lower half of the body and the legs, front legs. When I don't want to make it, leave, leave a paint ridge, I feather. 
because I'm going to cut the color edge with the dark blue with the darker color. Done. Set him aside. This palette is left over from last week's painting, so it's been wet continuously now for a couple of weeks. No problem. And little sections of it have dried out because, truthfully, I haven't been working with it for several days, and I haven't been diligent about paying much attention to it. So certain parts of it have, in fact, gotten dried out, but most of it's still wet. But you can see, I can hold all the parts that I need to hold, clean out with water. One of the things I do is I don't put a big full cup of water in there. I just put a little water in my cup. Two reasons. One is if I knock it over, I make a mess, but not a gigantic mess. I don't have a huge puddle of water. And number two, I change my water frequently, and I always dry the brush because I can't stand it when I, when I put a loaded brush into the paint and then it's all watered down and goopy and it's useless and it, I make, I'm sad. This paint job is going to zip right along, let me tell you. Now, the nose and the tail are yellow, so let's see if we can pick up a little yellow and white. Just enough to paint this yellow. As you can see, I got paint on the blue tack. Um, I'm going to use this blue tack up. I'm not going to try to reuse it. I probably, once I mess up blue tack, I get junk in it, or I paint it, or whatever. I toss it. Uh, I use such a small amount of it that it's fine. I, I, I can afford to waste little tiny blobs of blue tack. And I'm painting the yellow tail now because yellow is a much lighter color than the dark blue. And I'd rather cut the edge between the tail and body with blue than to try to cut it with yellow. I want to paint the inside of the mouth first because I think it'll be difficult to paint it, to paint it later. By using the hair dryer, you can speed yourself along super fast. And use, I, mean, I think for a painter, especially a paint and acrylic painter, hair dryer is like the number one primo best tool you can use. Use it all the time. Having dried these things now, I'm just going to go through in second coat. Time for second coats. My brush is still sufficiently wet. I got the body double coated. I got the blue head double coated. So now we can get on to doing the little teeny tiny parts. Mm, that's going to flood that white basin. Okay, well, I'm going to flood that white basin with orange. I'm going to have to come back in. We'll recut the white in there, looks like. No biggie. We'll get it. All right. I'm going to paint the ground color under the rabbit. Because it's also lighter than the blue, but it's probably darker than the yellow, so we don't want to mung that up. Might have to switch to a finer brush to go between and around things. Okay, we'll let that sit for a minute. Get that to dry. The reason I haven't put like a more finished base on this is I'm not exactly sure on where I want this thing to live yet. So that's why, if you're wondering why, the base looks kind of unfinished, and especially on this side where it's kind of chipped close to his body. All of that can easily be blended and smoothed and adapted to whatever environment he's gonna get put into. One of the things I never do is I never let my brush sit in the bottom of the cup like that because I can't stand bent brushes and they will bend, especially the small ones. So you don't want that to happen, do you? So I never leave my brushes standing in the, in the cup, even for a minute. Just don't do it. Not sure how, I'm gonna, how many times I'm gonna have to paint this eye. That'll be interesting to see. We'll know soon enough. And now I'm going to paint this little uh, hot dog colored mouth. And that was uh, easy because I'd painted the interior of the mouth earlier. I'm painting the body of the rabbit ultramarine blue because it's one of my favorite colors and one that I use all the time. Just using a really fine brush to try to 
cut this edge. But nothing's set in stone, like I always say. If I don't like what I've done, I can always go back in with the other color, the opposing color, and cut back. You always try to lay the dark color over the light color, but it's not set in stone. You don't have to. You can get away with a lot of monkey business. A lot of back and forth in a paint job. I'm really liking the little red hair waves. I think they work really well with the color and with the piece. And now it's time to start assembling. So I get the eyes in place and um, it's already is looking pretty cute. And then it's time to get the nose on, which is really teeny tiny. And I've got to kind of clean up the blue tack, but that went okay. And finally, we just assemble the whole thing. Got the mouth stuck onto the little chin piece. And now it's finally time with a little blob of blue tack to stick the head in place. Should go right on. Nice, and then the blue tack will keep it from swiveling around. And there he is. He's looking really good. <laughs> Perfect. All this left now is some light touch-ups. Here and there, I go over them, check all the colors, make sure that uh, he's uh, not got any obvious flaws. And uh, that goes by quick and easy. No problem. And there he is. There's our boy. He's looking pretty good. I'm really pleased with the way he came out. And um, yeah, nice. The whole idea is that these characters are going to live together in one world, one universe, and um, they'll all sort of match and fit together stylistically. And that means I've got to build a set or a variety of sets. And I'm really looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. All right, project done. As you can see, I made a bunch of castings. So I've got lots of rabbits that I can play with. Nice. I had a lot of fun making this piece. I hope you had fun watching this video. Looking forward to the next character next week. See you later.